get started. Thank you. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to be with you. <laughs> At least I think we're all together. Um, <laughs> That was a great presentation. I know there's a lot to talk about there, but I, I do think this builds on it. And uh, just as a teaser, let me tell you, you're all going to be so glad when I stop talking because Dennis is a rock star. And, uh, and uh, so I'm going to talk for a few minutes, let you know about Upskill America, what we're working on, how it relates to philanthropy. Then uh, Dennis is going to talk for a little bit. Then I have a few questions I'm going to ask him. And then uh, we'll do a Q&A. So that's how we hope uh, the afternoon goes. But. Um, uh, just by way of background, my bio is in the, in the folder, so uh, I, I won't go over that, but uh, the uh, five-second bio is Kansas, D.C., Kansas, uh, D.C., California. Um, there you go. Uh, but uh, um, to know, you know, this will tell you about me, but to know me, um, I grew up in a tiny little town in the middle of Kansas. There were six kids in my eighth grade class, um, and, uh, and we... Uh, uh, we were pretty poor, uh, you know, I, there's much greater poverty in the world, but we, we didn't have much. And um, I uh, uh, graduated from high school, had pretty decent grades, and uh, college, though, um, uh, would have been a stretch to say the least. And uh, I, um, through kind of a long story, I'll spare you the details, but I ended up uh, working at a radio station in uh, Concordia, Kansas, and um, the employer came to me uh, when I graduated high school and said, you know what, I know you want to go off to uh, university and everything, but if you'll stick around for two more years, I'll pay for all of your college. And uh, he said, you buy your pencils and your notepads, I'll pay for your books, I'll pay everything. You know, you come in early in the morning and you work, and then you go off to class, come back, fill in for somebody over the noon hour, and you're done for the day. And uh, that was, um, to say that was life-changing is, is not an exaggeration. So um, I'm sorry about that, a quick background, but it'll make sense why it, it uh, really relates to what I'm working on um, in, in what I do. So again, Upskill America is part of the Aspen Institute. The Aspen Institute has an economic opportunity opportunities program, and we're part of that economic opportunities program. Many of you probably know Maureen Conway. She's my boss, a wonderful boss. And um, at Upskill America, we've been around about two and a half years, and we're focused on, it's an, an employer-led movement to get employers to invest more in the education, training, and development of their workers so they have the skills that they need to move up in their careers. Uh, we have a leadership team, these are the organizations that serve on our leadership team. I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with them and related to them. Uh, HR Policy Foundation down there in the bottom, that was my previous employer and I still do some work for them, but that's an association that represents uh, chief human resource officers of Fortune 500 companies. That would be the one that might be unfamiliar to you there. Um, so what do we do at Upskill America? We're really focused on uh, recognizing employers who are investing in the skills of their workers. Uh, we've heard quite a, uh, quite a bit today about a lot of employers aren't stepping up, they're not doing what they should do. I completely agree with that. There are frankly some very bad employers out there, but there are employers who are investing in the skills of their workers. Boeing spends a billion dollars a year on the education and training and development of their workers, so there are some really good employers out there. Uh, we also uh, look at what those employers are investing in, and we try to help uh, spread the word about those policies and practices so more employers are investing in those policies and practices. And then we really try to share effective uh, uh, upskilling programs, you know, what works. And uh, it, in uh, June, we released an upskilling playbook for employers. It's available on our website. And uh, in there, we go through a whole lot of examples of what employers are investing in, how it works, and then we try to, to give some tips to help companies think through how they might create their own programs. And then finally, uh, our focus uh, from like, like today moving forward is really on developing tools for employers. If you will, um, the third bullet point there, uh, think of it more as a communication strategy to help uh, raise people's awareness about upskilling, what's possible, what's working, and now we're really trying to make sure employers have the tools that they need to start to, uh, uh, you know, create a new program, expand a program, or really take a program that they might have and make it more effective. 
Um, so if uh, this is my commercial slide. If any of this is of interest to you and you'd like to be able to track what we're doing, you can uh, sign up there on the Upskill America website or give me a business card and I'll be happy to, uh, to sign you up. We're really focused on eight areas. Um, the two of these are new. The badging, and I heard that mentioned earlier, that's a new area that we're adding. And then also we really hadn't done all that much around adult basic education. So uh, as we look at what employers are doing, these are really the eight areas that we're focused on. And so, uh, you know, this is where we really get into the meat of this. So why are we so focused on employers? Why do we want to work with employers? Well, as you well know, uh, most employers have the resources to invest in the skills of their workers because in many cases it's a, a business priority and they have to. Um, you know, a lot of times I hear people talking about, well, we want to reach the future workforce. Well, here's a news flash that I know you all know. The future workforce is actually most of them are employed today, right? They're already in the workforce, so we need to be figuring out how we can reach people who are already working today, as well as those who are coming up through the K-12 pipeline and all the other things that we did talk about today. And, you know, uh, higher education, the whole model has changed, right? Not as many kids graduate from high school at, at 18, go on to college for four years, only go to school and then graduate and then go into employment. You have a lot more people who are working full time, who go to school maybe at night or take classes. And then you also have, uh, you know, uh, people who are in school who are working part time to help cover the bills. So uh, education and workforce are really much more closely aligned than they have been in the past as far as uh, individuals' lives uh, go. And then, um, of course, employers are very uh, focused on uh, speed and innovation, how they can do things better. So that's why they're also investing in the skills of their workers and uh, just how uh, they can improve the processes in the workplace. Um, and employers, as you well know, they're really at uh, the leading edge of knowing what uh, skill shortages they're dealing with today. Uh, what jobs they can't fill, as well as what their future workforce needs are. What are they going to be looking for a couple years out? And then, of course, uh, employers are really also at the leading edge here of um, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, what jobs might be automated, what jobs might be going away. Um, you know, I was just with a uh, uh, Chief Human Resource Officer of a major company last week, and she said that uh, they have about 140,000 employees, and um, they went to their employees and said, uh, if you're doing something that really, um, it's kind of a routine job, and it could be automated, if you will help us automate it, we will train you for another job. Um, they had 20,000 people help them automate their job. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is not something we're talking about in the future. This is something that's happening in the workplace today. Um, thankfully, this was an employer who believes in education and training. They actually uh, spend $860 million a year in that area. So, um, it's uh, great that those two are tied together. But um, just amazing changes coming down the road. And if we aren't really closely linked with employers and working with them on this, um, I don't know how higher education is ever going to catch up. Um, all right, so here we go. This is the Jamie Fall Workforce Development Continuum, as, as I see it, right? So as you think about where do the workers come from? How do we get a worker um, in this country? So, um, you know, there are all kinds of things from early childhood development clear through the employment cycle. And let me just play this out a little bit. So this is really critical to the economy of our country, correct? So the government has created all of these programs to really, and of course, it's not just employment, right? It's uh, the well-educated citizenry and all these other things. But today we're focused on employment, so that's what I'm focused on. But um, Everything from Head Start, our K through 12 system that we have, um, the public colleges and universities, clear through employment, all of the workforce development programs that the federal government funds. These are all, not all, this is not an exhaustive list of the things that the government invests in because they believe it's so important. And then alongside that, you have employers who also invest in things. Um, so if you were to, uh, let me just get this out of the way, if you were to talk to the most curmudgeonly employer in America and say, well, what do you do to help the workforce? They're still going to tell you two things that they do. They're going to say, well, we pay taxes, and that helps support the system. And we also pay wages, which help people uh, uh, purchase these, uh, you know, education and training. So anyway, um, even if you think of like, uh, um, 
employers who don't do much, they all, in their minds, those are two very important things that they do. And that's just an employer uh, perspective that I think um, is worth mentioning. But you see all kinds of things that companies are doing. As I talk to chief human resource officers at different companies, they're really worried about uh, the ability to attract workers to a city that doesn't have a good education system. You know, uh, so many workers, you know, when you, when you get offered a job, what do, you, what do you look at? You want to look at housing, you want to look at the education system. So this is really critical, not just for employers and their own employees, but for their families as well. Um, em employees, uh, or employers, excuse me, are really doing some uh, wonderful things around uh, uh, post-secondary education, the way they're partnering with colleges and universities. Uh, typically when I go around and present, I spend the whole presentation talking about some of the things on this page, and I wish we had time to go into more of these, but uh, employers, uh, the University of Georgetown estimates that employers spend $600 billion a year on formal and informal education and training, which is more than half of the $1.1 trillion that they say that is invested each year. So, okay, so you've got all that the government invests, and you have all that employers invest. So that's an incredible amount of money. It must be working really well, and everybody must be really well taken care of, right? Um, clearly not. Um, we only have a 63% labor uh, participation rate, which is the lowest uh, it's ever been. 4.4 uh, unemployment is wonderful, but as you go to these other numbers underneath that and really dig into it and look at what's happening in a lot of uh, different populations within the U.S., the numbers are terrible. And uh, uh, if someone were to lose their job, the average duration for someone to be unemployed is more than half a year. So, you know, this doesn't work for a lot of reasons, but just to kind of simplify it and put it into some categories, really there's a lot of lack of access, right? People don't have access to programs, or sometimes there's a great program, and people don't have access to the finances that make, make that uh, an option for them. Lots of uh, problems around supportive services, and I think we talked about that. People have an opportunity to, uh, to take a class, but yet you, the car breaks down, they need help with child care, and a relative gets sick, and they can't complete the program. As well as transition assistance, so many people who can complete high school, but yet they go to apply for college, and it's uh, something they're not familiar with, a new system, and they, uh, they get lost in that transition process. Uh, one of my mind-blowing stories from a couple of weeks ago, I was on the phone with a chancellor of a community college system, and he said the best money he ever spent was when he hired a consultant to help his daughter get into college, because it's so complicated. Uh, yeah, um, so if a chancellor of a college system thinks the system's too complicated, yeah, it's too complicated. Um, too many people just really between preparation for ACT tests and other things that people have to do, unless you have access to resources, just seem overwhelming. Anyway, you all know this. This is what you deal with every day. And then there's a lot of trouble around uh, reentry navigation. Someone who maybe leaves the workforce, they have a child or uh, stay at home to uh, to care for a family member, trying to get back into the workforce, certainly someone who's been incarcerated, trying to get back into the workforce, all kinds of reasons that people leave the workforce or leave school, and it's incredibly difficult for them uh, to get back in. So, you know, just kind of in a nutshell, people can't access the programs, uh, they can't complete the programs, and uh, they can't progress once they get into the workforce. Those are really um, some of the things that we want to talk about. So what does philanthropy do? How does philanthropy help? Well, this is, this is what you all do, so I'm not going to you know, tell you about your own, your own work, but really, um, you're the glue that kind of holds all of this together. You come in, you help uh, expand access for people, uh, you help provide supports for, through many nonprofits, and uh, you help in, uh, ease a lot of the transition and the reentry issues that individual ha individuals have. So um, you help people get into employment and on a path to self-sustainability. And that system for a long time has really worked well. But this is like the thing I hate about uh, kind of the, the 
status of things right now is. Unfortunately, for so many people, employability no longer means self-sustainability, right? Maybe I'm naive, but I think we used to be able to say that, that you know, we could get somebody into a job and they were like on a path to self-sustainability. And that just is not the case anymore. Um, not all jobs are equal. A lot of people get stuck in an entry-level job. They can't get access to the skills or the education and training that they need in order to be able to move up and, um, and certainly don't have the resources um, to do more. So that is why that's why I'm here. This is what we do. We work with employers to make sure they're investing in the education, training, and development of their workers. Um, we help them uh, create programs, we help them expand programs, and we help them improve programs because you have a lot of employers that say, oh yeah, we have a uh, college tuition assistance program, and then you ask them what their take-up rate is, and they'll say, well, between two and three percent. Um, you know, a lot of uh, employers require uh, people working minimum wage jobs to uh, pay their tuition up front and then get reimbursed later. Um, there are just so many problems with the way employers set up their programs that they're not really workable or accessible to people in entry-level jobs. So that's what we try to do, um, work through these uh, different things to help them understand how they can improve their return on investment, also how it really plays into retention and recruitment. If an employer's not investing in the skills of their workers, they should not expect the millennial generation to stick around. Because if they start a job and they see that there's no future in that uh, workplace, they're going to be coming up with their exit strategy before they get their uh, um, orientation finished. So uh, we have um, one of the premier programs in America here um, that we're thrilled to be able to, to um, be a part of the presentation. Um, I've known about the Toyota program for a few years, and um, I just, it's, um, it's tremendous, tremendous work. So I'm gonna let Dennis take over from here. I'll be back in a few minutes, and uh, we can uh, take uh, questions and answer, but I think you're really gonna love what you hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you want Okay. Sure. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, I, oh yeah. Uh, I'm Dennis Parker. I'm with Toyota North America. Uh, I've been with the company for 30 years. This is what it does to you. I had black hair and I was skinny when I started. <laughs> but we. But uh, it's been an exciting, an exciting journey. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program that we have, and I think you'll see a lot of connections to it. Uh, the manufacturing program we have, and I think you'll see a lot of connections with it, with uh, much of what's already been discussed today. We also have what we call our T10 program. So everybody in here is familiar with dealerships, right? And they have the service technicians that work on the cars there. Uh, T10 is the program that trains our service technicians. It is an incredible program and it, it's an incredible career pathway and a gentleman named Rick Lester was going to be with me today to also talk about that. Uh, big picture, we make great cars, they keep great cars, right? Uh, Rick got injured just a couple of days before the, the conference, so he couldn't be with us. Uh, I'm not, uh, Joe, what's our timing? 245? I don't. Yes, you're good till 245. To 245. <laughs> Yeah. So if I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, mix in, I don't have his, his presentation up here, but I'm going to mix in a little bit of what Rick does on his, on his side also uh, with that. So uh, we call it the AMT program, Advanced Manufacturing Technician. It's part of a bigger system that we have called the Advanced Manufacturing Career Pathways. And you've already heard pathways a lot today, right? So where did this start? So with the clicker. Yeah, just throw it forward there, one. So while she's doing, so while she's doing that, I'll note, I'll note this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Toyota, but those who are may know that we're uh, we're recognized as a problem-solving company. We we really think in terms of problem solving. So. Uh, this program really arose from two different things. One of them is continuous improvement. And I'll just, I'll just say this very lightly, even though there's much more of a story behind it. Uh, AMT program technically started in 2010, June of 2010. What it actually is, is the fourth phase, fourth continuous phase 
of a 29-year continuous improvement process. Every program took a large part of the DNA uh, from the program before. What is different about AMT is where we began to really reach out to other employers. We added additional items to the curriculum. We really engaged colleges and made it into a, into a whole career pathway. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and, uh, because I know we're a little bit time limited, even though the slide's not there yet, talk a little bit about that problem solving aspect. So we face, I say we, but don't think in terms of Toyota, think in terms of all manufacturers, but then beyond that, think in terms of anyone who employs technicians. We face three really big problems in the U.S. The first problem is there are not enough technicians to fill our job openings. No matter how hard we work at it, we go out and we find everyone we can find, we still have openings that we cannot fill. Some numbers for you. Uh, Deloitte did a study for the National Association of Manufacturers in 2011. 600,000 unfilled positions. Folks, when, when technicians aren't at the factory, the factories don't run, and when they don't run, it impacts our economy, right? So there's sort of the, the, the high level connect the dots. They refreshed that study in 2015. Oh, by the way, that 600,000, that was the largest job gap of any sector. Good to go, thank you. That was the largest job gap of any sector. Healthcare, retail, transportation, you name it, that was the biggie. They refreshed the study in 2015. In 2015, they project that eight years from now, 2025, that gap will have grown to two million. So we already thought it was pretty ugly when it was 600,000. It's going to get way worse before it gets better. And then beyond that, we have another problem. And the other problem is, is that the technicians who are out there, who mostly are the ones graduating from our technical programs, just to be very frank about it, they're not job ready. And they're not job ready for a number of reasons. One, their technical preparation is actually not what we really need. But beyond that, there is almost no instruction out there, or if you find it, I, I shouldn't say instruction, it tends to bring up one kind of model, right? Development for the kinds of work practices that we need in the workplace beyond, beyond technology, right? But also, there is almost nothing out there that actually develops what's commonly called the soft skills. Now, you might find an occasional teacher who's very progressive and very assertive and she or he does an incredible job with their students, but that is inconsistent and it's not something that can be applied to the, to the system. One of the, one of the ways I like to illustrate where, what kind of drives the core of what we did is this, is I can go visit a uh, community or technical college that has technical programs, and they're happy to see you. It helps to work for Toyota, it's a recognized name, right? So they're happy to see you, and they're proud to show you their facilities, and they'll give you a great tour and a walkthrough, and you'll see incredible equipment, and they'll talk to you about the great qualifications of their faculty. And that's all well and good. We don't want to knock that at all, right? That's all well and good. Now I can turn right around to an employer and I can say, tell me about your best employees. Why are they your best employees? Well, of course they're going to mention technology. They're going to tell us how technically competent they are, you know, how technically smart they are, you know, because they're technicians. But then they're going to say, well, you know, he or she, they come into work every day. I never have to worry about them not being at work. And they are great problem solvers. They have super initiative. We're never having to tell them what to do. They're basically doing it and very often telling us what we need to do on that. And they get along with people, you know. And so do you see this difference, right? This is what we need in the workplace. This is what makes it rock in the workplace. This is what helps us to about put out our product, which is good for everybody, right? But we don't prepare people like that in our education system. And so there's, there's the gap that we have. And then we have an aging technical workforce. If you, look at, uh, if you look at the average age of technicians in the U.S., I've actually lost track in my head now of the, what the number is right now, but a few years ago, this is scary, right? Uh, I think it was in the 50s. 
That's average age. Now think about what that means. So we've all, there was a time when we talked about when they started to retire. And that time is over because they're retiring. And now you go back to the other two problems. There's nobody to replace them. And the ones that are, and realize when a retired worker walks out the door, they take years of experience, company knowledge and company know-how, equipment familiarity, right, with them. And we replace it. Well, we probably can't replace them, right? But if we do, we're probably getting someone who's new and is not work ready. It is an incredible problem. So what we did at Toyota, because this started with Toyota, but part of the story is going to be it's no longer about Toyota, we realized something. And what we realized was is we, or, or maybe here's a different way to say it. This is the way I say it to employers sometimes. So you're having a hard time finding people, right? on that. So what do you do? Let's go out and put ads in the paper. But since it's hard, let's put more ads in the paper. Let's make them bigger, right? <laughs> let's make them in color. <laughs> we'll do that, you know, and we'll throw a website up out there and let's go to some more career fairs and do that. And we go to that career fair and that's great. Let's put our table up and drape the little company you know, cloth across it and throw our little boards up over it and, and so forth. And while we're doing it, I can watch those other 57 employers doing the same thing to get the same people who there aren't enough, right? And this is what we came to. It's not going to work. What we have been doing before, what most are still doing now, is not going to work. And it doesn't matter how much harder you work at it, it's not going to work. So something had to be completely redone from the ground up. And so that's what we did. We basically, we weren't looking, can we improve this or make that better or get this connection? We said, let's think this from ground zero. The old, I know it's a trite phrase, but the old, uh, you know, wipe the board clean, clean slate type of thing. And we ask ourselves, how do you get, how do you get this worker that we need? Uh, and so, I want to, well, before I get there, let me take that away from you so you're not reading it, right? So one thing that we did, because this is actually a fairly short slide set, one thing we did, we had to know where we were going. So instead of thinking of a bunch of good things to do in education and a bunch of things, good things to do in development, we ask ourselves, what are the characteristics of this person that we want? What are they? And unfortunately, that slide's not in here. I realize that now, but if you... Uh, Joe, I'll give you a bunch of stuff to put on the website if you want it, and you guys can access this. But, you know, all employers are going to tell you, I need somebody who can do a good job, <laughs> right? I need somebody who can, you know, who can really effectively do the work. Well, what do you mean? What is that? So we worked out the details, okay? We worked out the details of what we need with ways that we could know if we got it or not, and that became the end point. And then we got busy figuring out how do we get there? And what we found out is, is every time we thought of something we needed to do to get there, it turned out it was really important we had to do something at the step before that. And then we had to do something at the step before that to make that good. And before that, and before that, and finally, believe it or not, we're talking about kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> it, so the answer came on us. It has to be a career pathway, right? It has to be a career pathway, and along the way, there are going to be a lot of changes for everybody, including us. So, some of the program highlights. The program was employer visioned. It was developed by employers. It is driven by employers. One of the things that's very different about the program, uh, I know the, the word paradigm is overused, but it's, uh, it's applicable in this case. A paradigm change for us was that we would actually have to be the leaders of this program. The schools have to come to our table to help us with our program rather than us going to theirs, which was a big change for them, right? Goals, global best, uh, excuse me, global best, Entry level technician, and we mean that, global best. It occurred to us, if we just do some good things, by the way, uh, as employers doing this, realize we bring some really different perspectives to these issues, right? Educators have very valuable perspectives. They come from a certain angle. 
advocacy groups have certain uh, perspectives. They come from certain angles, but they tend to be aligned pretty closely to educators, right? As employers, we bring something totally different. It's all valuable in the end, but we're not thinking from the same place, right? We're not, th we're not thinking about, well, what's a good education practice to do, or how can this be a little bit better, or how can we do that a little bit better? We said this outcome has to be global best, and it's not a rah-rah statement. It has to be global best. How do we actually produce someone at the point of two-year graduation who we can say is better than the technicians are producing in Switzerland than they're producing in Switzerland, right? By the way, I'm familiar with the Swiss system, and one reason is is because they're really good. And Germany. When you hear, when you're talking about technical education, you're talking about the global gold standard, what do you typically hear? Germany, yeah. Why is the U.S.? Why is it not the U.S.? And so that is a type of thinking, right? If they are giving their tech, if they're giving their companies better technicians at the starting point, that means they're going to do better work sooner with stronger outputs, and they're going to have to invest less of their money. Not that we don't want to invest, you'll see that. They're going to have to invest less of their money in getting that person work ready while we're doing just the opposite, which hurts our business, which hurts our society. It makes no sense than to have any other target than Global Best. It's going to be really hard, <laughs> let me tell you. We want to be college debt free. We want to take that problem totally off the table, and we wanted every single step to be best practice. What are we doing at primary school or elementary school? We want it to be best practice. What are we doing at the two-year college? We want it to be best practice. What are we going to do with the bachelor's degree? I said this is a career pathway all the way up, right? It needs to be best practice all the way. So we had to be dedicated to that. The focus had to be to not develop technology, but to develop that person who really makes it happen in our workplace, which is the whole person and the entire package that they bring. We needed total student engagement. Anybody know? I'm going to assume the vast majority in here have been to college. And I'm going to assume that probably I'd bet a $50 bill right out of my wallet if I had one in there. I would bet every one of you had a pattern that's very similar to this. Mondays and Wednesdays, you had a 9 to a 10.30 and a 1 to 2. And Tuesday to Thursday, you had a maybe a 9 to the... Is that right? Yeah. Do you know how long that model's been in place? What did what I hear? Oh, way, way, way short. <laughs> way short. It kind of goes with the college model that we have. Think 1100s. Folks, it's not changed, right? But let me tell you where I'm going. You weren't totally engaged, right? If you were like a lot of students, like me, you didn't pick 8 o'clock classes because why? <laughs> you had to get out of bed. And what were you doing the night before, like I was? <laughs> Partying, right? <laughs> to do that. And, you know, you had those times in between classes. We know what those are for, right? That is so you can go to the library and do study and do your planning and, make, you know, Great. What did you do with your time between classes? Yeah, you socialized. Figured out how I was going to party that night, right? That's what I did. I ran to the dorm and took a nap because I was worn out from doing all that. I'm saying that a little bit humorously, right? But that's how it was. You were not totally engaged. When you look at the fact where the U.S. is today in educational standing in a competitive way, see, we bring that competitive thought into it. We bring that competitive aspect. When you look at how we stand to other economic competitor nations, we can't afford anything less than total engagement. If we're going to stay economically competitive and have that bounce back into our society. Data-driven decision making. Ask any college in... Who's from college in here? Who's from college? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hands are going like this now. They're not... Everybody... <laughs> everybody saw that... Everybody saw that set up coming, didn't they? Now pretend I don't have this slide up yet. Who's your number one customer? You're in college. Students, thank you. That was the answer. That's exactly what I'm wanting. Ask anybody. Students are the number one customer. Here's a paradigm change, folks. And what I sometimes tell people is, is that sometimes we didn't just change the thinking. We had to go 180 degrees. That's not going to do it for you if the student's your number one customer. Who does your number one customer have to be? your employer. And that means when you have a decision that you would make differently 
because the employer is the customer as opposed to the student, that means you actually have to make the decision on the employer side. Some things that come later will show the effect of that. But especially if you're from the education world, that's hard to wrap your head around, right? But then we added three more. We said this program can't just change the customer from the student to the employer. Let's leave the student there. But if it ever gets down to the nitty gritty, we have to go with the employer side, but economic development. You weren't thinking about that, were you? You have to design a program where economic development says, I gotta have this right now. And what is it you have to put in that program or what does it have to do to do that? And then here's the colleges, and these are the colleges that work with us. What is AMT? Basically, it's a career pathway, but note that we're starting right down here at K-5, middle school, high school, two-year associate degree, which we totally changed what we did, an internship, some companies use it, some don't, and finally to a team member. This is even advertised in today's program as the Toyota program. It was vision developed by us. We're still at the core of the development and doing that. But now it's really famed, Federation for Advanced Manufacturing Education. It's now the companies working together. And so we are very actively changing the identity of this from the Toyota AMT program to the FAME AMT program. These are the steps where we said you have to do best practice at every single step. Not good practice, not better. Something that kind of rocks, we can present that somewhere. Lowest presentable unit, you guys know about that, right? And so every single one of them, we have to look at this and we have to try to answer ourselves and say, we don't think it's being done better anywhere else. Not just for the benefit of being better, but in the way that it actually contributes, you know, uh, tangibly contributes to what we're trying to do in the pathway. Here's what we did at the college. We changed the model which says your major's technology, have a whole bunch of technology classes, have a little side dish of general education, and have a degree. By the way, no matter what your major is, that's what you did, wasn't it? Are you a history major, philosophy, political science, chemistry, engineer, have a whole bunch of these courses, have some general education, we all like that dish, right? And have a degree. What did we do? We added something called the professional behaviors and we had something called the manufacturing core exercises to it and they are equal. They're not a side dish to the technology, they are equal. That is that whole person. What are the professional behaviors? Well, we've got 13 of them actually, but six of them we identify as the core, attendance, initiative, diligence, interpersonal relationships, getting along with others, teamwork, and communication. The five manufacturing core exercises, safety culture, not safety training, you get that, culture. Uh, lean manufacturing, visual workplace organization, problem solving, not math, analytical, critical, structured thinking to solve problems and machine reliability. And so all of these now have to be addressed. Here's your total student engagement. At least, don't forget that even though I didn't write it, at least eight hours every day. Five days a week, two at the school, three with your sponsoring employer, five straight semesters. Did you get that summer off in college? I did. What did I do? I partied more, right? <laughs> Hold your hand up. Okay, um, well, how many of you in here are in the, in the employment side as opposed to college or school? How many are in the employment? Hold your hand up high. This is not going to be a setup. Okay, now, I want you to leave your hand up if you get the summers off. <laughs> Does it make any sense that we're going to take a summer off of learning when we're in college and adults? That's what high schoolers and middle schoolers do, right? So five straight semesters in the program. Uh, what I don't think I've put up here, employers choose the entire curriculum, including general education. Because it turns out you can't learn enough in two years anyway, so we prioritize what's there so that you graduate with maximum readiness. We changed the environment. I suppose the new illustration, I should have taken that out. We'll have that. Schools agree to make an open working emulation an open working emulation and get out of classrooms. Every time I go to one of our factories, I have yet to see a classroom coming down that line. They are not realistic, especially in the two-year technical college. So we create an open emulation that looks, operates, and feels like the place of work. Place of learning feels like the place of work. Imagine that. 
These are just some other pictures from some of the things that we do in that. By the way, faculty will tell you after they get over the change they had to go through, it's more interesting for them too, and they learn more from it. Here is what employer engagement looks like. Here is that same pathway right here. And now let's see what employers do. Employers engage in different kind of programs at this point right here to encourage STEM interest. And then at the high school, we actually recruit from the high school. Recruiting is very different than a normal, the, normally the way it is. And then when they go into college, we co-educate those three days a week, right? We've totally interleaved school and work. And then the internship, we confirm their skills, and then we hire those dudes <laughs> because they really, they're really good, right? Global best to do that. And so now you have this kind of engaged partnership. Notice that I'm going to also point out Project Lead the Way down here. There's no need to invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel when it's already the best wheel out there. We believe Project Lead the Way, there's many good programs. We personally believe Project Lead the Way is the best, most impactful STEM program in K-12 today. And so while we work with others, we consider them to be our most important partner and they're actually part of our ideal pathway right here. This is the rest of the advanced manufacturing career pathways. Do this at K-12, here's the core AMT program. Most students go the technician pathway. Is that really a career? Well today, Leah Curry, who started as a skilled technician in our Indiana plant, is president of our West Virginia plant. There's your career pathway for you there. In skilled maintenance, we need work leaders, team leaders, supervisors, foremen, managers, middle management, executives, and presidents, right? So it's a whole career pathway. But what if you would like to go over here into the engineer? Notice I didn't say engineering. This is not about that. This is about the person. The engineer is your person. Technician is your person. That's why we don't call it advanced manufacturing technology. Here is your engineering pathway. It starts with graduates of AMT. And then here is the business, advanced manufacturing business pathway. It's based, and we have an incredible set of helps worked out with this. It's based on the working adult. So they graduate over here, they're working uh, 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week over here. If it's 60, it's their choice, by the way, to do that. And they can still continue to advance their education. That takes you all the way. We've got two master's degrees in place now. So we've put together essentially a program that we have intentional structured engagement in kindergarten that can take you all the way to a master's and that's why we say this, what's your passion and your talent and how far do you want to go? It's a hop on hop off pathway. If you find the place where you perform best and you rock the most, how incredible is that for you? How incredible is it for us? And there's the magic in bringing that together. So those are the advanced manufacturing career pathways. I think when I came to the round table, if you, you remember what year that was, Joe? It was in Philadelphia. I think we reported 83 companies with us. Today we have 305. So we now have, we have, we're in nine states, 22 community colleges, two more in formation, three universities, 800 students in the first or second year of the two-year phase this year, and 305 companies are engaged with those chapters and students doing that. We're now thinking in terms of Fame USA. So we have Kentucky, not just Fame in the state, Kentucky Fame, West Virginia Fame, Indiana Fame, Mississippi Fame, Texas Fame, Tennessee Fame, uh, Alabama Fame, Missouri Fame, and our newest one who just started a few weeks ago, Louisiana Fame. These are some of the companies, large companies that participate with us. Small companies, look at this, non-manufacturers are hopping in because they say this rocks. Turns out they need the technology and the soft skills and the workplace practices. Even though it was started by an automotive company, this is not an automotive specific program. They're now starting to take the base model. U.S. Chamber of Commerce has already given a grant taking the base model that underlies this and are starting to develop and explore it into areas beyond manufacturing. Finance, equipment operators, healthcare and IT are being developed. So now it's going, the, the, the base model is going beyond manufacturing, even racing. 
Garrett Smith lead the Kentucky Speedway, not because to promote this, they have technicians. They're part of the program to do that. I will tell you, this driver is on fire with us. It. It's, it's way beyond a paid sponsorship for him. But you can see the car, Kentucky fame, Indiana fame down here in fame. Results. The full-time, on-time graduation rate in this program, even though we think it's the hardest technical program in the U.S. because our standards are really high. You've got to make a C in every class. D, you're out. But how does that affect students? The on-time, full-time graduation rate is 14 to 18 times the national community college average. We are graduating 70 to 90 percent of the students who start. Of those who graduate, 90 plus percent placement into full-time work with the original sponsoring company. Great for the graduate, great for the employer. Graduates earn 50 to 75,000 in the first year of employment. Now I'm going to go back to the point about the students. It may sound backwards, students are not the number one customer, but it turns out if you change the approach, their graduation rate is incredibly higher, their placement rate is incredibly higher, and their starting wages are higher. That is paradigm change in thinking to something that works. The program has won seven awards so far. We can't say what it is yet, but there's number eights coming a little bit later this year. <laughs> So how do you do it? If somebody is interested in doing it, we have this schedule of support now. AMT, I'm doing one tomorrow, by the way. I have to be in Louisville at 8 o'clock in the morning, Eastern time, which is two hours later than this, right? We have a national conference. We also integrate with the National Career Pathways Network Conference. We have the AMT Academy, two weeks of intensive training in how to do this for colleges, employers, and everyone else that we do in July. What do you think we charge for it? You're going to say zero, aren't you? You're wrong. For the AMT live thing, like we're doing tomorrow only, we charge 25 bucks a head to help the school cover lunches. Otherwise, we provide all the training free. This was a grassroots program. It's not commercial. So if you get this link, watch the video. What if, I'm going to tell you three things about it. You see all four customers speaking. You see the career pathway. Look for the second graders. You find in here, and this is a non-Toyota-based collaborative. We need people with the right skills to do the jobs of the future. And quite frankly, we needed them yesterday. We're investing in employment, we're investing in skills and workforce development, we're investing in high schoolers, we're asking the local business community to drive that. These are the actions that are gonna be the difference and this is why I'm confident that the vision for us to become the manufacturing hub of excellence in America is not a pipe dream. It will come to fruition but it's our job to make it happen. Our ability to generate skilled labor in this community is directly linked to our economic viability. Kentucky Fame is a great partnership for Kentucky. It brings together manufacturers, the education community, and students to be able to promote manufacturing and the jobs and careers that are there for manufacturing. What makes Kentucky Fame a little different partnership is it's led by the manufacturers. The quality, and the precision that's required in the automotive space is extremely high. Each month we make 43 million individual pieces in North America, so you can imagine the, the requirements that we have are quite uh, extreme. For us, there's really no one on the street that can do what we do. You know, it's not like experienced automation technicians that are walking around looking for jobs, right? Now, a lot of people think you make an investment, it's in equipment. It's just not equipment, it's people. If you want to grow, you have to grow your people. Northern Kentucky has been blessed with, you know, being leaders in lots of industries that are all facing these similar challenges. And so it's aligning the core curriculum and the product that comes out of the community college to the direct needs of those companies. We chose Kentucky Fame program. It was academic. It was not only technical, but there was the academic piece. And then there was the behavioral piece as well. And they're learning how to problem solve, 5S safety, all those combined, working at the company and going to school, this was a program that we wanted to do. So one of the things that we've struggled with is how do we marry what they're learning in the classroom directly into what they're being trained on that week. And to build a curriculum for that, an on-the-job training plan, we can't dedicate that kind of resource to that for that one apprentice that we have. But what we can do is have all the trainers from the FAME program come together and look at how do we do that as a group. And then all we have to do is how do we specialize that for Han? Kentucky FAME's just given me 
a very broad, high demand skill set that is sought after by a lot of manufacturers today. As a small business owner, it provides a solution for me to hire cost efficient employees that are being trained the way I need them to be trained. I see the smaller companies working together with larger companies and having partnerships. There's some things that Mubi, as big as we are, that we do not invest in. So we build partnerships. You start working together with other companies, start learning things, and before you know it, you become a team. Working with Bosch and Han and all these other companies now as a cohort, we work together. We're doing business with each other now. So we became a, a big family in Northern Kentucky. The partnership is really about getting a feel for the world that is advanced manufacturing. And our Kentucky Fame students know the world they're gonna work in that in our programs, and you can take a look you know, around our facilities, you can see the stations that they're working on are the very same technologies they're gonna be working on in the workplace. So what they tell me is, I have confidence that what I'm doing here matters. And you don't always hear that in, in education. There's sometimes a question about, is it relevant? Is it gonna make a difference? Why do I have to learn that? You never get that in our advanced manufacturing classes. You spend these two years in the FAME program and it really guides you in what you want to do. Three days work, two days school, and it's set up really nicely because you take what you learn at school in your tech classes and then come to work and do it. And then right after I learn how to do it, they tell me, okay, the next time if this ever breaks down, you're the one fixing it. <laughs> Nine months ago, I graduated from high school and I've already traveled for work. I've already gone to Mexico to train other maintenance teams how to MIG weld. I'm already thought of as an important player in our company. It's just, it's amazing. To be able to come out of college with 22 months debt free and have at least a year of work experience that adds value to the company immediately. It's tremendous. I think some of the uniqueness of the North Kentucky fame in our evolution is we've done a number of things that I think have been leading edge. The mentoring's big. We do big on mentoring. We do big on recruitment. It's never too young to get students interested in manufacturing. Today we'll be doing a tour of first, second, and third graders to show them what our robots can do and to get them interested in the sciences and the math. We go through high schools and you know we're trying to get everybody to think differently. If you go to NASCAR, we sponsored a NASCAR. What's our biggest neighbor in Northern Kentucky? Kentucky Speedway. Hey, my name is Garrett Smithley, and I'm driving in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. I've worked with multiple winning teams early in my career. Currently, I have the honor to be working with a very special team, KY Fame at Kentucky Speedway. I've learned a lot about KY Fame, and it has a similar skill set that we have in racing. So I, I want the Kentucky Fame program to be considered world-class. We have a structure that teaches people the right hard skills that they need, but an environment that is applied, more project-based learning, and the soft skills that they need to be able to communicate and work together. And if we have a robust program that is viewed as highly effective and we're building this pipeline that is establishing this highly qualified workforce, that's going to make it more attractive for other people to come in. And all that means is we need to keep going because it's, there's never a point where we're going to be done. Kentucky Fame has been a real, real gem for us. We've been, been lucky to be a part of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for advanced manufacturing in Northern Kentucky. More jobs are opening up and there's lots of opportunities. I think what Kentucky Fame does for Northern Kentucky is it connects us to the world. Future looks extremely bright. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see where this program takes me.